Let's pray. Heavenly Father, transfigure us in Jesus' name. Amen. Transfiguration connects a bunch of the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As Jesus and his disciples, at least at Peter, James, and John, are hiking up the mountain where they're going to hear God's voice and see Jesus transfigured, um, we're reminded of Moses hiking up Mount Sinai to meet with God. We see the law, and we see the one who comes to redeem us from the law, Old Testament, New Testament. And then there's Elijah, the cranky, manic, depressive, uh, depressive prophet who anointed kings and priests and for whom God sent a fiery chariot to whisk him home for, to heaven, bypassing that normal avenue of needing to die first. And I should mention, by the way, that every good Jew knew that Elijah had to show up before the Messiah could come and save everyone. Aha, ta-da. We now see the dots connecting. When I was at seminary, we would sit around the soup and ask questions that had no answer. Now, whether we were trying to sound smart or whether we were giving voice to some of the things we didn't know, it depends on who you ask and when you ask them. One of the things we debated is where Lazarus went for the four days that he was dead. Now, here's our premise. In Exodus 33, God tells Moses, you cannot see my face. No one can see my face and live. Hmm. Now, if you can't see the face of God and live, then how could Lazarus go to heaven? I mean, because God lives there, right? I, he was there four days before he comes back. Uh, did God blindfold him? Um, was he trapped in a netherworld region, which was neither the earth nor the heaven? Um, was God out of town on business? Uh, we would debate that for hours. Such discussions are the equivalent of how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Now, there's actually two answers to that question, in case you were wondering. The first one is 42, which is the answer to the ultimate question. We just don't know what the question is, but this could be that question. But the more theologically correct answer is, as many angels as God wants to dance on the head of that pen. You see how it works? See, there's a difference between asking a question out of faith and asking a question out of doubt or foolishness. One seeks an answer. The other actually seeks nothing. The heart and soul, and of course God, are the only ones who know the difference between the two. Let me take you to Exodus 33.20 for the full context. Moses went up on the mountain to meet with God and receive the Ten Commandments. It, it, it happens in our Old Testament lesson. While he was gone, the people panicked and decided that they wanted a God that they could see and, and control. So they melted their jewelry into a golden calf, set it up in the middle of the camp, and they started partying. When Moses walked into the camp with the stone tablets, everyone was surprised because they thought he was dead, and now it's just awkward getting caught partying with that golden calf. Now Moses' brother, Aaron, who was in charge while Moses was gone, he tried the old, you know, I, I kind of accidentally threw a bunch of gold into the fire, and magically this golden calf came out trick. It, it didn't go over so well with Moses. Moses got angry, had the Levites kill 3,000 of the leaders to make a point, and then he went to God to see if he could fix things. Moses accepted responsibility, even though he wasn't there. He knew that he was the leader of the nation. He told God, if you can forgive, great. If you can forgive us, then we'll go from here. If you cannot forgive, wipe them all out and wipe me out as well. Blot us from your story. And then Moses took a deep breath and waited for God's answer. You know, God forgives, and life in the wilderness went on for the Israelites. Now, regardless of who made the calf and why, Moses still felt responsible. And even though God has forgiven the people, Moses had to know what his relationship with God was. Most of us know what that's like when we fail someone or hurt someone. We need to know how they feel about us and whether things are back to the way they were before we messed up or whether we have to keep walking on eggshells. So in Exodus 33:20 it says, Moses begged, please let me see your glory. And God said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. The Lord continued, Here, there is a place near me. You are to stand on the rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. Now, this points out the clash between the holy and the unholy. 
there's always a dominant element. When light shines in the darkness, the light always wins. When the unholy is invaded by the holy, the holy always wins. God is holy, Moses is not. Do you see the problem? Sitting around the soup at the seminary, we all tried to imagine what would happen if we suddenly came face to face with God. You know, we're going around the corner and there's God. Would we melt, like in the Indiana Jones movie? Uh, would we turn to dust, like in the other Indiana Jones movie? Or would we find ourselves on the exploding edge of the newest galaxy where light and matter were ever expanding out into darkness and nothingness? What would happen to us based on Exodus 33? We were deep in the what-ifs when someone said, how does this line up with Deuteronomy 34.10? None of us wanting to admit that we didn't know what Deuteronomy 34.10 was. We turned to that person and said, well, what do you think? Case, by the way, you don't have that verse memorized. It says, no prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, wait a minute. If God knew Moses face to face, what happened to the old no one can see my face and live thing? Now, the easy answer is that God was just being metaphorical. When it comes to the whole see my face and die, or I knew Moses face to face, one or both was just God making a point. Kind of like in the gospel lesson last week when Jesus said, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Jesus didn't really mean that, did he? I mean, it's much easier to believe God is making a point and doesn't actually expect us to take him literally. Except... You see, the danger of using the whole metaphor as an excuse for things that make us uncomfortable or things that are really hard to understand or things that we don't like, well, the problem is, next thing you know, we'll whittle the entire Bible down to just, in the beginning, amen. There is a middle ground. Now, it's a holy tension that is uncomfortable, but also allows us to take God at His word, but not have to pluck out our eyes or accidentally get vaporized because we came face to face with God. Transfiguration is no less troubling or amazing than the manger in Bethlehem. Jesus' baptism with the dove and the voice from heaven. The day Jesus came walking out on the water in the middle of a storm. Or the multiplying of the fish and loaves without a Costco or an in out burger anywhere near them. Or the cross. The cross where God dies to save a rebellious world. Most of the time, Jesus was just Jesus. He was the son of a carpenter and the son of Mary. He had brothers, went to school and church, got a job, put his sandals on one foot at a time, just like everybody else. In fact, Isaiah 53 says he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. Just like Clark Kent, who when he is wearing glasses, nobody knows who he really is. For Peter, James, and John up there on the mountain, one minute it was also normal. It was the Jesus that they'd, well, they'd been hiking around with for quite a while. And the next minute, everything changed. Now, he was still Jesus, the one they'd seen hungry and tired and whose feet ached and robes were dirty with dust. And yet, in a moment, he was also the Messiah that they had been waiting for. A holy glow beyond explanation, shining through his humanness, his face and clothes blinding them. And when you add the voice from heaven booming like thunder and Moses and Elijah showing up, how do you explain that to yourself, let alone anybody else? You know, when I arrive at home after dark, there is a lamp in the corner of our living room. Nancy and I bought it over 30 years ago. It's not that pretty. And all day, it just sits there in its lampness. Nothing special. And yet at night, when I walk in and tell Alexa, let there be light, it starts to glow. It transfigures the whole room. Now, because I know it's a lamp and its purpose is to bring light to dark places, I'm not surprised. Now, if the toaster oven or the recliner started to glow, that would get my attention. The disciples had seen glimpses of Jesus' glory. They had witnessed a tiny fraction of his power, tasted a sample of his love, and yet they weren't ready for this. In a day and age before special effects, they could not comprehend what they were seeing. So when Jesus told them not to tell anyone else until after he rose from the dead, it was probably a good thing because it's doubtful that anyone would have believed him anyway. Peter, James, and John, by the way, they would have known the Old Testament, including Exodus 33. On that day up on the mountain, they very unexpectedly found themselves in the presence of God. They actually saw God face to face. In fact, they realized that they had been walking and talking and working with God for years. They knew he was special. They just didn't have a clue how special. And for a fleeting moment, I'm sure they thought about that whole, no one can see my face and live. And they probably wondered what was about to happen to them. 
Bernard de Clairvaux, who lived around the year 1100. And yes, today he is known as Saint Bernard, and I just think that is awesome. He wrote about the love of God. He broke love up into four degrees. And when it came to that fourth and final degree of love, this is what he noted. This perfect love of God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength will not happen until we are no longer compelled to think about ourselves. It is within God's power to give such an experience to whom God wills, and it is not attained by our own efforts. God chooses who he will reveal himself to. There is so much of our life where God is present. In fact, God is present at every moment and every place. And yet, so often we don't see him. Like that lamp in the corner of our living room that just sits there doing nothing most of the time. During the day, I rarely walk in and say, well, hello, lamp. In fact, even though it's very visible, to be honest, I don't see it. It's only at night when it glows and brings light to the room so that I can do the things that I want to do or need to be done. But, you know, I still don't ever remember saying thank you, lamp, for bringing light. On the other hand, when I want it to work and it doesn't, that's when I notice it. And that's usually when I start to complain. Mm. Here is where we discover the meaning of seeing God face to face and no longer being able to live. You see, the closer that we are drawn to God, the less of ourselves we can see. And when we come face to face with God, we can't see anything except God. All of the unholiness is burned out of us, and we are reduced to a soul, a beautiful, eternal, and holy soul that reflects the one who made it. When we are in the presence of God, as St. Paul said, it is no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in and through us. Do you see how this works? If we run away from God, if we do everything we can to distance ourselves from Him, His reflection grows smaller and dimmer. But the closer we come, the bigger and the brighter his reflection is in us. Luther's explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed goes like this. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gift, sanctified me, and kept me in the true faith. Well, most of us, at least when we are at church, would say that we want to be led by the Spirit. Most of us are scared of just such a reality. What if God asks us to go somewhere that we don't want to go? To give up something that we don't want to give up? What if He tells us to move somewhere or talk to a stranger or forgive that person that we really do not want to forgive? Are we willing to surrender to Him? Come face to face with Him no matter what he asks of us, be drawn so close to him that we can't see anything but him. How much of you, the real you, the, the you, by the way, that makes you, you, remains when you are sleeping? If someone were to see you sleeping, would they know everything about you? Uh, could they tell by your snoring or sleep position or number of pillows everything about you? Do you believe that you are still you even when you are sleeping? To be afraid of getting so close to God that we lose ourselves is a fear a lot of people have. They're afraid that they won't be them anymore. The whole dying to self and living for Jesus can be a little scary, and yet it is what we have been called to as disciples. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, a, a Christian, a, a follower, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. When the voice from heaven went silent, and Moses and Elijah left, and Jesus quit glowing, what Peter, James, and John saw was the Jesus that they had always known. It's just now they knew more about who he really was. Every once in a while, something so powerful, so bright, so alive, transfigures an average human, and we are moved to tears or cheers, or to become like them because we saw in them, even if it was only for an instant, something that we desire for ourselves. It doesn't matter that after their act of bravery or sacrifice or love, they went back to being the soldier, the sailor, the mom, the parent, the grocery clerk, the lawyer that they had always been. Because even in their ordinariness, we now know who they really are. They can't hide it anymore. We've seen the truth. Such is the calling of Transfiguration Sunday. We are, in the eyes of God, much more than anyone can see or even that we can know. 
as we are drawn into the presence of Jesus, eventually coming face to face with him, we don't need to be afraid of losing ourselves. Just the opposite. We will discover who we really are and always shall be. And by God's grace, the rest of the world uh, will notice us being transfigured. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.